what's happening, guys? Uh, happy Monday, February 24th. Like a month has flew by, huh? It's almost gone. So weird. <laughs> there I am saying that thing I was clowning on before. Where does all the time go? It goes by so fast. But really, February is a short month, so it always feels crazy short, right? Um, anyway, I had a good weekend. But I do. I did a live. I did a live. Let there be talk at uh, Bob's Espresso on Saturday in the Valley over there in the NoHo Arts District. That was fun. Live. Let there be talk. It'll be up Thursday. A little bonus episode with uh, my good friend, comedian, comedy producer Jay Davis, who was on. Uh, what was he on? He was on uh, Tourgasm. If you ever saw Tourgasm, so that. That'll be on Thursday, but that's Thursday's episode. Get into today's episode. Today's episode is just awesome, man. My guest is... I'll tell you who my guest is right here. It is... This is a horrible intro, but I just walked in the door. Sorry. I was out doing comedy all night. It's 2.30 in the morning. I was at Disneyland today. All day, up at 8. I went to Disneyland today. Uh, My guest, Richie Kotzen. Guitar. Guitar king. Man, that guy's great. Plays with Billy Sheehan. Remember, I had Billy Sheehan on a few few weeks back. They got a band called the Winery Dogs. But uh, I've known Richie over 20 years. And he tells some amazing stories on this podcast. He... He basically told me, this is what he told me. He said, I want to come over. Or he didn't say this, but this is what happened. And then after, he texted me and said it. But he basically called this his most honest, personal, raw interview he's ever done in his career. If you're wondering who Richie Kotzen is, maybe you saw Behind the Music years ago with Poison. He was the guy that took CeCe to Ville's place in Poison. And then ended up with the drummer's wife. I'm not going to give you any more of the story because it's all here on the podcast and it's a great story. He tells his side of it. Um, He also played with Mr. Big. Pretty incestuous podcast here. I had, of course, Eric Martin for Mr. Big. Billy Sheehan also plays in Mr. Big. Richie, fantastic guitar player. Guy's got a killer voice. Check out some of his YouTube videos live at the Baked Potato. They're mind-boggling. Uh, my particular favorite is he does Sarah Smiles from uh, Hall & Oates, and it's just incredible. He's a great guy. He's been playing music all his life. That's fucking hard to do. Very few people get to do it. And when you get to do it, it's a lucky thing to play music your whole life. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Richie's on. You're going to love this, even if you aren't into rock. Or I couldn't imagine not into rock and listening to this podcast. But if you're just into, you know, whatever, the story's going to knock you out. It's so good. He also has an amazing story about what happened with him and Michael Richards. Uh, You know, Kramer. A week before the famous meltdown at Laugh Factory. Uh, Richie has his own Michael Richards story, so that's all here. It's pretty cool. I went to Disneyland today. I usually go, I try to go every year around my birthday, Uh, but I haven't been in a few years. I've been so swamped and it's crazy money now, but uh, my good buddy Steve Henry took me for my birthday. Thank you, Steve Henry, comedian Steve Henry. We've been friends since I started comedy. Great guy. We just... Man, we had a fucking killer time today. I don't know when the last time you've been to Disneyland or if you've never been, but I've been going since I'm six. I'm 48 years old, so (laughs) that's how Bill D'Elia tweeted today. I said, when I was young, um, such and such about Disneyland, and then he said, they had Disneyland when you were young? (laughs) It's a good one, Bill (laughs) D'Elia. But it's weird. I've been going to Disneyland since I was six, 
And it's just magic still. It's weird. Even as an adult, you don't ever outgrow it. And, and that place, I've got it like, it's, it, I've got it. I think as a kid, you just memorize it. It stamps in your brain the whole map of the place. Like they hand out maps when you walk in. I'm like, I don't need no fucking map. I know I walk down Main Street and I turn right, Space Mountain's there. I turn left, I've got uh, Thunder Road Railroad or Pirates or Haunted House. I go straight, I've got the uh, Matterhorn, which I call the Ball Smasher now. Man, I think fucking tore up my ball. Just like a <laughs> Matterhorn. Matterhorn got new cars, by the way. They used to make you go nuts to butts on the car. <laughs> And now they've got these cars at seat three. So, so I guess maybe, you know, they got tired of uh, people not wanting to ride nuts to butts with strangers. Can you imagine that? You're in line like, okay, you two, and you're just straddling a, a stranger on a roller coaster that you're sliding back and forth into. You're basically just f- simulate fucking on the Matterhorn. <laughs> Anyway, so the nuts to butts is gone on the Matterhorn. The sub is, uh, they're rebuilding the sub. I don't know. Uh, This is the third sub since I've been alive. The first sub was so amazing. It was was the original like 10,000 leagues under the sea with the squid would come. And then they redid it during the Nemo, Captain Nemo or Nemo. I don't even know what the fuck it was. And they fucked it up and now they're redoing it again. They... They've also still got the cars, but they redid the cars, and those are dumb now over there. But then over in Carland in California part, they got a great car section. So I don't know. I still love the place. It's a love-hate. There's stuff there that sucks. Um, like they, got, they get rid of all the classic stuff. I know it's because I'm old, and it's like, oh, I miss the classic stuff. But the key thing to Disneyland is just the wackiness of the – that late 50s, early 60s vibe or whatever of, of just those weird rides, man. You you know, don't take that wackiness out of there, man. That, that 50s kind of gives it that simpler times vibe, which makes it cool. I'm rambling about Disneyland, but I do love it. It's a magic place. It's as, as corny as that sounds. You go there and you just, you have fun. I wrote Space Mountain. Probably one of the most epic rides ever built. I remember when Space Mountain first, you know, they had it down at the Florida one, and I never got to ride it. And then it, it came here, and it was just like, wow. Space Mountain's so good. But, you know, Disneyland, awesome. So I was there all day. Thanks, Steve, for taking me. And I still think back to the uh, 60s when they wouldn't let hippies in. If you were a guy with long hair... You couldn't get into Disneyland. Hair past the ear. Which is absurd, right? Like, you know, they wouldn't they wouldn't let the doors in if they wanted to go. Sorry, no hippies. But meanwhile, there's just like you know, like soccer moms walking around in yoga pants today. Just basically they look naked. Yoga pants at Disneyland and you know. Everyone's tattooed head to toe. What a different time now. Classic. Love that. Uh, Quick shout out to any women Dell raisers. I've come to the conclusion. I think my uh, following's about 98% guys. So basically, I'm the heavy metal of podcasts. And I'm the heavy metal comedy. Comic. (laughs) I'm the heavy metal comedy. I'm the heavy metal comedy. It's comedy. <laughs> Fucking out of it. But right? I don't know. Is there any women Dell Razors? Any women listening to this podcast? Tweet or email Dean Del Ray at Yahoo. Just curious. It's, it's funny. I just see all dudes follow me. I'm like Iron Maiden. It's hilarious. I got a donation this week. Thank you, Jeff Williams. So cool. I'm, a, I'm always blown back by a donation and touched man that's so nice uh jeff williams thank you man i'm gonna get into the episode here before i do don't forget i was down at disneyland today which means i stopped by los angeles harley davidson which was right up the street from disneyland 
2635 West Orange Thorpe Avenue, Fullerton, California, Los Angeles, Harley Davidson. Go in there. They're having a huge February sale on all pre owned bikes. They also rent bikes there, which I keep forgetting to tell you guys. 69 bucks, 24 hour bike rental. Any day of the week through February, they've got a $69 rental. You can get a bag, you can rent a bagger. Let's see. I'm looking, I'm on their website right now. Look at the guy. Their website's Los Angeles Harley Davidson of Anaheim.com. Yeah, look, they got street glides you can rent, road kings, ultras. 69 bucks, man. That's a it's a deal. So if you're coming out to LA to visit, rent a motorcycle and ride up to Malibu, man. If you you, you have not lived till you rode the PCH on a on a motorcycle through Malibu, all the go all the way up. Take it all the way up to uh Hearst Castle. Wow, it's such a great ride. Anyway, Los Angeles Harley Davidson. Great sale on pre-owned bikes and uh, running the 24-hour bike rental deal right now. Tell them Dean Del Rey sent you. Thank you, Los Angeles Harley. Love you guys. They also do have that Twitter. Hit them on Twitter and say hello. Tell them you know me. The Twitter is... Boom! L.A. Harley Anna. All right, guys. Thanks for the reviews. Keep those going on iTunes. And keep the emails coming. I love them. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. Get ready right now. Richie Kotzen is live on Let the Beat Talk. Richie Kotzen, my guest today. How are you, bud? I'm very good. <laughs> we just had a false start. That's yeah. hilarious. So you want to... I've known you, what, 20 years? 20 years, yeah. Yeah. yeah, when the false start, I was saying that we met in uh, San Francisco in Novato, yeah. right in, in Marin. Yep. At uh, in Mike Varney's kitchen was when I remember, and you were um, doing an ACDC thing back then, right? Yeah, I was. I would do a tribute to Bon on his birthday every year, yeah. and I would do that once a year at the Stone in San Fran, and I'd put together all star guys. And I think the year you played, did Paul Gilbert play drums? Yes, yeah. I remember that. That's yeah, yeah. crazy. And you were uh, just, what, out here from Pennsylvania? I was going to do a record for out, Shrapnel? I was going to do my first record. I didn't know anything about anything. And as a matter of fact... I think I met your dad. Did he come out with you? The first time, yeah, because uh, my, my parents uh, wanted to know who this character was that, that was signing me to a record deal because I had just turned 18. So they came out and... Uh, I remember I never even knew I, I never had I never had sushi yeah. until I went to San Francisco. Yeah, well you're from Pennsylvania. Yeah, right? they, they must have had it then in Philadelphia. I, just I don't wasn't know. Aware of it. Or maybe they didn't have it back then. I mean then. maybe, but it wasn't sushi didn't really get hot until the 90s, I think. Okay. Cuz like what yeah. what did we meet in the 80s or something? 89. 89. Yeah. You know, it was more of like uh, fine steaks, I think, people would go to. That That's was right. the, the thing, you know. O yeah. Or in San Fran, you, you're going to go have like uh, crab or something, you right. know. Right, but good seafood. I, I never rocked sushi until, you know, 90s, I think. Okay, oh, then that makes sense. Yeah. I'm not a total idiot. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But, so, you know, it probably didn't hit uh, your parents' area until 15 years later. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> right? Totally, yeah. So you played in my ACDC jam. What song did you play? Do you remember? I don't remember. Uh, that I don't remember. All um, right. But I do remember one thing, which is the weirdest. It coincides with uh, my birthday party at the Stone, and we had the same birthday, February 3rd. That's right. Me, you, and Bruce from uh, from Racer X. Oh, I, oh, yeah, I didn't realize that. So the yeah. three of us have the same birthday. And now I just found out a comedian, Jay Larson, I think it was, had the same birthday. But anyway, we had the same birthday, which was so that's weird. Cool. Because when you think about it, that's the day the music died. You know, uh, Buddy Holly, Big Bopper, and Richie Valens went down on that day. Wow. So... There's three music, not the same year, but imagine if we were the same well, year. It's a good it's like thing we three, never traveled together. Yeah. <laughs> but all three <laughs> of us were musicians, and that's the same day, which is weird. That's crazy. 
So I, I, knew, I knew you for a long time, but then I didn't see you for a long time. Yeah. And then we run into each other in uh, Japan at, on the Stones tour. That's right. Uh, I was opening up for the Rolling Stones on their Bigger Bang tour. So that was it's so cool. weird. We're in Tokyo, yeah. like 20 years or whatever goes by. Yeah. And, and there we are, the two of us in Tokyo, in the Tokyo Dome. I know. But, and I didn't even know you were opening. And I walk by, and there you are, and you're, and they're getting ready to announce the band going on. You I know. know? That, but, that was a surreal thing. You know, when that, when that happened, I remember I didn't really tell anyone I was doing it until after I did the first show because I, I didn't want to... To jinx it. Of course, because I knew it was, it was very fragile. At any moment, anything could change. Yeah, you know, like, I, who's I this guy? There. What? I could be over there and suddenly they changed their mind for whatever reason. But, you know, the people on the crew were really great and um, they, uh, you know, said, you can go anywhere you want on the stage, but stay off the ramps. Yep, and, the ego you know, ramps. Well, yeah, and, you know... We're a, a, a trio, so we kind of play close together anyway. So yeah, yeah, ramps wouldn't mean much to me. Um, but man, it, one thing that was cool about it, I just remember getting on stage and and really being able to hear. Like it was like the best sounding stage sound ever. Yeah, they and don't it, fuck around, right? And, you know, I mean, it, you would think it could have the potential to be a nightmare because you're in a. a a, a stadium. stadium that's enclosed. It was huge. What was it? 80,000 Tokyo. I don't know what it is, but it, it was all the domes over there. It was the Tokyo... Osaka Dome. Uh, Osaka Dome. And then there was another Tokyo, sh extra Tokyo show in the in the sports arena. Yeah. And then it was Sapporo, the Sapporo Dome. Oh, yeah. There were six shows, I think. Yep. And... Um, were those the biggest shows you ever played? For me, yeah, I think they're the biggest ones I ever played. Yeah, I never did any of those huge like festivals. Actually, my girlfriends play bigger shows than me. She played in front of like two million people. Yeah, that's really? a crazy. Who's festival your girlfriend? In Brazil, Julia Lagi. She's a bass player uh, from Brazil, and she was in a, a band that's very popular there called Baja de Saia. Oh yeah, what style of music? It's like country brazilian country i guess you'd compare it like to our dixie chicks maybe or something oh like yeah that. so they sound like sepultura a little bit exactly no. <laughs> yeah but she <laughs> she she was in the band since she was 17 but she just recently left and and is in the process of of moving here to to you know get her own one visa and start doing shows and 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 sessions and stuff like that but um my point was is that you know like some shows. of my friends have played much bigger shows than me right but um i i I don't really, I don't really care if it's a big show or a small show. I just want it to to be a good show, you know. I just yeah. need to hear my band and and like the way we play together. We play off of each other, right? So if I can't hear, you know, I can't react. Yeah, yeah. It's and, like it's like comedy. Yeah. If I can't hear, if somebody says something in the crowd and I can't hear it, I'm fucked. You know what I mean? Of, yeah, because you'll play yeah, off. I of need that. to play off it. So yeah. if the guy's too far back, I'm like, "Fuck! I didn't catch that. Yeah. Damn it!" You know. But I understand it. You know. Um, I mean, Hendrix. If you listen to classic trios, uh, Hendrix, Cream, all those, uh, even Nirvana. You know, they they go places because yeah. uh, they're reacting off each other. Where if you got a bigger band, you don't have to really worry because there's like a blanket laid down by maybe a B3 sure. or a rhythm guitar player. You yeah. can just do whatever you want. Or even a lot of the mo more modern bands. I mean, if you're playing, you know, you, know, you have hit songs, you, you get on stage, you're playing your songs and you're not really deviating too much. Yep. You know, someone like me, you know, not that I don't have songs, but I'm not a mainstream artist, so... If I want to stretch out a solo section for you can do it 20 minutes, want. I can, you know, yeah. and, and we do stuff like that. And that's kind of what saves me from like losing my mind on a tour. It's like I, I like that creative freedom. You know, I'm not a jazz guy, but I have some of that in me. And maybe that's where it comes from, you know, yeah. like the, the improvisation elements. I, I understand uh, that. Like even a comedian, it's just kind of like. I, I I never could understand doing the same set every night, man. You just rock into a robotic mode. You need to feel something. And I guess you're saying like you you got your skeleton. Yeah, you, know, you, you got, got your, your skeleton. You got the you, fucking the, the songs, the outline, you know, yeah. the outlines. You know what you're gonna do. But then like you have to have. It's nice to have that freedom of just you know weaving weaving around and and it's inspiring and different each night. 
Let, let's talk a little bit. So you grew up, you grew up in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And and I, I've had a million people sit on this couch. They all say the same thing. It was Kiss that got you going, right? Actually, yeah. 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 Isn't it funny? It's it, interesting. If Kiss is the gateway drug, uh, it, that's what Cedric Bixler called it—the gateway band. You it, know? it was because you know they appealed to obviously everybody in the seventies, but little kids when they saw all yeah. the, the lights and the fire and Comic the costumes, books. the little kids went nuts. And I was one of those little kids that saw that. Like I don't know where I saw the poster, but then there was they didn't have obviously like music television. Yeah, yeah. Every now and then you'd see something on the news, and I'd see some kind of moment little video little, footage yeah oh my god what is that you know yeah and um and i became a fan and i remember i mean i was really little and i wanted the poster in my room and my mom was like richie aren't you gonna be afraid of those guys having them in your room <laughs> like no mom that's kiss that, yeah. they're really cool yeah gene's got the blood and the oh, fire yeah, exactly. you yeah. know it just looks like and he's calling himself the demon right. child right you know Right. It's funny you know, that, that that evolved, you know, into like you know. Suddenly, I'm a teenager. I'm 12 and 13, and every day I'm going to school in like a different heavy metal rock shirt, and they all were like, one Black Sabbath shirt had like a crystal ball, and it said six six six. Oh yeah, ball. that was the Dio era yeah. one. And then there was another one where there was um, uh, the um, Iron Maiden number of the Beast. Oh yep. And I, I had all these, you know, Satan shirts. Satan shirts and. <laughs> I guess me, they thought I was a devil worshiper back then. Well, yeah, it's uh, that, the Satan imagery sells, boy, that's for sure. To yeah, kids yeah. In, high, in, in junior high, 13, 14, you're like, yeah, yeah, man. You put on that number of the beast record, and it's like, well, to those of earth. To, you're yeah, like, yeah, a, exactly. whoa, because the devil brings his, you know. That's, that, that's Vincent Price saying that, isn't it? What's that? Isn't that Vincent Price? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, so great shit, you yeah. know. So you're listening to Kiss, and then... That gets you into guitar, right? That's what got me into guitar. Because yeah. you, you originally are a guitar guy when you signed with Varney. Yeah. Now, by the time you're listening to Kiss to the time you signed to Varney, mm -hmm. what turns you into like the sweet picking guy? Is it Ingve or is it those no, guys? No, it wasn't Ingve. I, w as far as the guitar thing, I was more of a Van Halen guy. Gotcha. Um, I mean, I, I wasn't really. When I grew up in my house, there was rock music, like classic rock, and then there was a lot of R&B. My dad had all the R&B records. Right. My mom had all the classic rock records, but there was not, there was no classical influence in my right, history. Right, right, neoclassical. That yeah, guy. I didn't have any, or even like real classical music. And nobody would. They, it was either like soul music, or blues, or classic rock. And so, when I I got into the guitar, it was initially you know, the, the basic rock stuff. And then I heard Eddie, and then that's what made me want to really study the guitar. Right. Up until then, I just liked rock songs. You know, what was your them. first guitar you got? Was it a good one or a shitty one? No, the, well, the very, very first one was, was a piece of junk that was, we got at a yard sale. I was taking piano lessons, and then I, I said I wanted this thing. And my father's like, well, you don't practice the piano. And I, and I said, well, no, I'll, I'll play this. And so they, they took, they bought the guitar and I went to a local teacher and he said, You this is unplayable. Yeah. So the, the like strings are eight feet was, high yeah, off the yeah. A piece of junk. And you so, don't even know, right? When you get it, you're just kinda not. like you're you're trying to figure out how do you get your fingers on these? Exactly. And I was really little. So um he he said, If you want your son to learn, you're gonna have to get him a real guitar. Take him to the music store and get something. It doesn't have to be expensive, but a real guitar. So I, the first real guitar that I had was a Gibson Marauder. Oh yeah, that's a great guitar. Yeah, I have. have you, I haven't seen. I'd love to find one. I haven't seen any. You know who's playing stores. those now? That band Ghost. Really? Oh no, no Marauder. No, the R D artist or whatever. That one that was like a round explorer. You know oh, that I don't guitar? Know what that is. No. That's a weird guitar. Marauder was the one like that Paul Stanley Paul. played. It looked kind of like. Didn't that's really? the one he smashed. Yeah, Every okay. show. It had the diamond headstock, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah, instead of a standard Gibson headstock, it had the pointy headstock, and and that's the one uh, Paul Stanley would bust in the in the 70s. So it was a cheap guitar. <laughs> well, it was, uh, uh, I think it might have even been bolt-on. 
neck yeah, yeah, for, for Gibson, which is the only bolt-on neck they had. Yep, you're right. Yep. It'd be fun to find one of those. And then after that, um, my once I once my parents realized I was really serious about it, I might have been 12 or 13, they went to the store to buy me a Les Paul. Sick. And the guy at the store convinced them that they needed to buy this Yamaha SG2000. Oh, I know that one. The Dave Medichetti model. Yeah, and Sa Santana was playing right. it. Which is actually a great guitar now. It's a really good guitar, and that was the thing. And so they, they bought it for me, and that became my main guitar, and I used that guitar for a long time. What color was it? Red. Red. And I had a white one after You still that. got it? I have those, yeah. That's I'll never get rid of those. That's crazy because, like, my first guitars... I don't have it all, you know what I mean? Well, but I can understand if you start becoming a serious great player, you get sentimental value. And also, that feel of that guitar, how you learned on that one. When you pick another one up, it might not sustain like how it does, or the action might be weird, or the pickups are shrilly, whatever, and you keep going back to that one. Of course. And there's two guitars that I really wish that I never would have lost. and, and One more than the other. Um, one of them is uh, a Gibson SG, and it's the one, you know, in 63, I think it was called a Les Paul. Oh, yeah, the three, three pickups. Okay, yeah, yeah so then, was it white, sure, cream? Mine was brown, but it wasn't It wasn't a 63. It was a few years after that. Oh, they re-brought it back they out. they brought it back out, and I think it was a 69 or 70. I remember it was mahogany. Yeah, yeah. it was brown, three pickups, and I, I loved that guitar, and it had a tremolo on it. Oh yeah, and I was again. I was a little. I was young, and I was playing the tremolo like a lunatic, trying to make it sound like Van Halen. And of course, yeah. I really couldn't because it's and, a different kind of tremolo. Yeah, it's just a, more of a kind of a jazzy one where you just rest yeah. your hand on it. Woo. Yeah, exactly. So I ended up snapping it off one <laughs> night, and I broke my guitar. I'm like, right. Oh my lord! So the next day, my my mom took me to the music store, and I took the guitar in where I bought it. And I said I need to get it fixed, and the guy at the store. I, it was just now as an adult i think what what a jerk yeah the guy at the store said oh this is it's worthless now you can't fix it I'm oh. like, what do you mean there's no way to fix this forget it i can give you store credit i'll give you two hundred dollars oh so he mom, robbed you of your 60s, he robbed, 60s sg uh -huh. yeah literally fred bernardo is his name so if he's listening to this fred i know what you did to me when i was a kid wow what and a so, dick right and, yeah and so um what I ended up doing was using this two hundred dollars store credit to buy a Mesa Boogie one hundred twelve cabinet. Oh, I, got I, a full guitar for a cabinet. Uh, yeah, and, and now that guitar is probably worth about seven or eight grand. Yeah, and and then the other guitar that I had, I was fifteen, and I this guitar was like a love hate relationship because I, I loved the way it looked, and I tried to get into the way it sounded, and it just never sounded right. And it never really played right. It felt really delicate and strange. But I had a Paul Reed Smith. It was one of the first ones. It was the 121st one they ever made. Wow. And I ended up, when I went through my divorce, I sold a bunch of stuff, like yep. a package deal. And that was like the centerpiece of the deal. Wow. And that guitar ended up in San Francisco with uh, one of Varney's friends, I think, bought it. And I would imagine that guitar is probably worth a lot now, too. You could probably get it back, though, that one. Yeah, I probably could. But at least I know it exists and yeah, I know where it is, yeah. so whatever. Did you ever get into the early Charvels? I was. Yeah, I remember, man, when those Charvels came out, the first Floyd Rose without the fine tuners, I got one of those, man. Somehow I just, you know, worked and, and got a job and, and bought one from a guy. But he had fucked it up. He, it had the Strat headstock, and he had cut the Strat part off to make it look like a point, but it was still the original star body, body Charvel, San Dimas, wow. Floyd Rose, non uh, And I remember I got it, I was like, this is Eddie Van Halen. And I had an amp, I had an amp peg. The guy sold me an amp peg. He's all the bigger the speaker, the better. Just sold me a 15, right. which is a bass amp. Of course. I'm plugging it in. I don't even know what effects are. And I'm like, it doesn't sound anything like Van Halen or ACDC. It's <laughs> right. just like bling, bling, yeah, bling, exactly. clean with a 15. That's awesome. And I'm just like, boo, boo, just doing dive bombs. And I just put it in the corner. That's Ended great. up trading it for cocaine and a red leather jacket. 
Uh, How <laughs> loser is that? That's Michael awesome. Jackson's big. The guy had like a red leather jacket from oh Wilson's House of Suede. I go, give me that eight ball of Coke and that jacket. Wilson's. Yeah, remember that? Yeah. They were red hot back then, yeah. Wilson's. I think they're they, still they around in the They now. were in Pennsylvania. Yeah, they had them everywhere. Yeah. So you started. Did you, you have st- a store called Chess King? Chess King, man. They got the <laughs> Chess King jackets, right? You try to get like stuff that looked like rock clothing. Right. <laughs> like, like a nightmare. I mean, you know, you, you want to look cool. Like when you get older and you realize you're in LA, you go, these fuckers just, people made them great shit. And those people are still alive now. I'll yeah. run into a guy. He's like, yeah, I made uh, Keith Richards pants. You know, Robert Warner. He's like, 75 tour. I made that stuff for Keith. Wow, and, that's cool. And those guys, and you, you meet these guys later and you're like, oh, I wish I, I mean, you could wear it. I can't wait. You get all fat. You put on like fucking leather and you look like a time traveler. I, I'm the heaviest now I've ever been in my life. Yeah, but you still look good. You're 44. Do you work 44. out or anything? No. I don't like to do anything that raises my heart rate too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kidding. right. No. Uh, you know, I did. I went through a phase where I worked out like a lunatic. I remember I went to, um, we made a record when I was in Mr. Big called Actual Size. And we made the record in my house, which in the beginning I thought was a good idea. In the end, it was a terrible idea because... Eric and I really just were just hammered by five or six in the afternoon every day. Oh, you guys would do some drinking? Oh, my God. And then I would wake up in the morning and put the Kahlua in my coffee. Yeah. And so, I mean, I was drinking all day and all night. And and then, because, you know, having all that traffic inside my house and I couldn't get away from it, you know. Yeah. And so um, the uh, when I got I went to Japan to do the, the press tour... I got off the plane and the the promoter grabbed my stomach and said, "Oh, Richie, son, you got fat." <laughs> and uh, and Mr. Uh, 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 Udo or whatever. one of those guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I was. It wasn't Udo, but it was one of his guys. He just says that to you. And I was like, "Oh man!" So I immediately, when this was like I don't know, two thousand something, I, I immediately went on the no carb diet Atkins. and I started working out like a madman. And I was spent like two hours in the gym, and I still drank a lot. But because I didn't eat, I didn't eat carbs, and I've smoked a lot of cigarettes, so I didn't eat much at all. Yeah. And I worked out a lot, so I got into like, I got into really good shape, you know. And and then I stayed that way for a while, and then suddenly I, something happened where it's like, ah, fuck it, I gave up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I guess I'm. I it could be worse at 44, but. Well, I mean, you know, uh, I was talking to um, Billy, who's in uh, your band now. And that guy's 60 or whatever, and he fucking looks dynamite. But he said basically he's like on an Atkins-style diet for life. He's been on it, you know? Yeah, he, you know, in my from my perspective, because I spent a lot of time with Billy, um, he just eats in a sensible way. In other words, I mean, I, I've seen him eat sandwiches and, and stuff, but it's like, you know... It, it, if he eats a burger, maybe he'll just take the top bun off. And I can't believe we're talking about the, the musicians talking about no, no, how we eat is yeah. like ridiculous. But the thing is, it's it, it's so weird because it's but, part of rock and roll. Because once you don't look good in rock and roll, it's the first thing everybody talks about, right? I they guess, don't go, you can put but like a, I was never like I, I'm a guitar player, man. Like I'm not a friggin' You know, I never. I'm not a model, right? <laughs> right. Like it's, uh, but like Springsteen it's, looks dynamite right yeah, now. Yeah, I guess it, it, it's tied together somehow. But you know, I, I'd be more worried about like if suddenly I couldn't sing, you know, yeah, or your hands <laughs> fucking. Yeah, you I might know? break my fingers or something. Knock on something wood. <laughs> anyway. Uh- so you come out to Varney's and you you sign to Shrapnel Records. Yeah. And you do a solo record for him. I did. And three. three records for him, and uh, you're starting to get a name for it. And then you you join Poison. I did. That's an interesting scenario. Yeah, right? that's a great story. Let's hear that. So, well, what happened was, I did my first record, which was released in 1989 with Mike. It was kind of a crazy shredding guitar thing, and immediately realized that I wanted to uh, make normal records with you know normal rock records with a guy singing and right and that sort of thing and so it evolved into me singing from there and 
Mike actually was the one that convinced me that I should sing lead. And so we did my second record, which I'm sing- I was singing lead vocals on. The first time I ever did that. So it was very hard for me to listen to. Like there's certain moments that yeah. I was like, oh, I can kind of see how I evolved into a singer. But very like sh- immediately after that, like that net following year, I really kind of found my 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 voice. And so I ended up getting signed to Interscope after that second record. Oh, I remember that. And they moved me to Los Angeles. And that was in 1990, 91. Yep. Around that time. Were you living, uh, while you're doing the Varney records, were you still living in Pennsylvania? Yeah, but my cousin lived in San Francisco, so I used to stay with her. Yeah, because I would see you a lot. Yeah, like, I lived. Yeah. I kind of was living there yeah. and going back and forth. And then when I came to L.A., um, it was because Interscope signed me. And I spent a year in L.A. writing with people. And I had uh, I got to the end of the year, and Danny Korchmar submitted a budget to produce my record, and I was really excited. And I was fighting Interscope, but I felt like at that point I had won the battle because I wanted to make like a Blue Eyed Soul record. I I, I saw myself somehow as like Daryl Hall with with right. a heavier guitar, with a guitar solo. Yeah, well, that's an interesting thing. Before we go any further, like you and I, I mean, uh, I, you don't know, but I love blues. Uh, R&B style rock. Uh, you know, there's this band that was signed to uh, Columbia called Sweet uh, Sweet Vine, and the guy sounded like Otis Redding. They were like Allman Brothers meets Otis Redding. You know, wow. I, I always liked, uh, uh, of course, the early, you know, Sarah Smiles, uh, Rich Girl, all that, yeah, that yeah. stuff. Also, Eric Martin's, uh, you know. Um, Sucker for a Pretty Face record. Mm-hmm. And I talked to Eric about it quite a bit. Those records, I fucking love. They never sell. It's so weird, right? Well, the, wait a minute. If they're done right, they're, they're the hugest thing in the world. Because right. Sarah Smile and Rich Girl No, that, the biggest... yeah. I'm saying, I'm talking about, uh, like, there's all these records I love that guys did it. And you right. see him, you go, man, this guy's incredible. That, of course had uh, an 80s machine behind it, you right. know what I mean? The private eyes and stuff like that got was big before the Sarah Smart. You had to go back. That's true. Yeah, yeah. you had to go back. Well, and actually, Hall & Oates, Daryl is literally from like eight miles down the road from where I'm from. So right, he and he a, sang he on influence. every fucking... He sang the backgrounds on all those... Yeah. Uh, early uh what was it not motown but the other way I, I forget sigma sound right something now. he was like a background singer so he was around all that well so yeah it that's just that's what i saw myself as and that's what i wanted to do and it was constant resist resistance and then what we, we how did they see you did they, they see you as like a, rock to be guy? a heavy metal guy and, oh, I, wow. and i despised that and i was like I, I was like i don't even like metal like i liked not to be a dick but i liked metal like when i was 12 and 13 right but now like i'm living in la i'm 21 and i've got like you know the end of the innocence was like one of my favorite solo records Fuck when don Henley did that. i've right? got his guy that wants to make a record on me and you're arguing about it don so, henry that's a masterpiece record right oh yeah so i had this all lined up finally figuring i'm gonna make the record i want to make and at the last minute the label said no they first approved the budget and then they suddenly said no we didn't sign you to be this kind of artist right. which is the most insane thing you could possibly say we didn't well, then what did you do you signed me to make me something that i have no interest in being well what are you now, listening did, to the songs that i wrote that you signed me based yeah, on yeah i was just going to say you had how demos does that happen? you don't just get a fucking right. record deal they listen to the demos they understand you're kind of wanting to be this vision it didn't sound like pride and glory right it's not no. a three piece fucking burn rubber uh rock right, band right so you know, I, I guess what had happened is they signed me based on what they thought I was, based on the previous record that I did, on and then Trapman. suddenly I evolved into this kind of no, I want to be like you know, I want to do, do this other thing, and that's what my roots are, and that's what I want, and so I ended up getting dropped. Yeah, and as I was getting dropped, they told me that um, the guys from Poison had reached out about me because I'd already been on the cover of Guitar World magazine and all this right. bullshit. Who, who who drops you? Tom Wally? Yeah. He just says, hey, we're dropping you, but by the way, Poison's looking yeah, for a guy? It was very friendly. It wasn't, yeah, he's a cool dude. It wasn't bad. It, yeah. it, it was like, I was, I was the one that was aggressive and I was like, I was losing my mind because I was here for a year writing and finally, I felt like I had the ultimate 
writing partner, producer guy lined up with Danny, and then suddenly they pulled the plug. So I really, I, I snapped. Yeah. And I was like, you guys don't know what you're doing with me. You got to let me go. You got to let me out of the contract. Yeah. This, will, I, I can't. I'm not going to make a the metal same rock thing with Linda Perry, kind of. You know, she's the, she, she does. Uh, you know, four on blondes, and then all of a sudden. They, she's going to do a solo record and tell him why. He's like, okay, we'll just get different people and keep it four and on blunt. She's like, no, no, I want to make Dark Side of the Moon. And then he's like, oh, okay, go ahead. And then he just shelved it. And she went crazy, like, drop me. Get me really? fucking out of here. <laughs> he, was, he was cool in the sense that he's like, all right, look. He said, we're going to let you go. He said, we could be really creepy and like sink our teeth into you for years from now. Right. But we're not like that. We're going to let you go. And, and his point was, you're still young. I don't think you really know exactly who you are as a solo artist. And he might have been right at yeah. the time. Um, but he still should have left me make the record because I think it would have been really cool. Yeah. But anyway, he said, we're going to let you go. He said, in the meantime, I think you should go do this Poison thing because they had been calling about me and they were interested in, in blah, blah, blah. He said, you should go at least meet with them. And yeah. maybe you do it for a year or two and then you come back to me and we can talk about making a record then. Right, so that's that, cool. That right? was the plan. So yeah, so that and that was totally because cool. he could have locked you down. Oh, he could have really messed for me seven up seven years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. couldn't make any records. No, no, no. People call and go, "Oh, sorry, man, I'm oh, no. locked here." Yeah, so that's and, like, and, and executives do that to people. They do, yeah, they do because they want to get you back. They're like, "Hey, fuck you, kid. We signed you to do a metal record. You don't do that. You don't work for anyone." Yeah, yeah. Blackball. I have plenty of weird stories like that, like weird ultimatum things that don't tie into any logic from through, record companies through who different labels different labels yeah but I, I i can get to that stuff later but you know in the end i went i did the poison thing and i really liked the record we made because wait hold on what, what's that like they call you and ask you to come down yeah uh and do they tell you is cc out of the band yet or is yes. it secret no I, I think people knew he was out of the band okay but we, I, I first the first thing that happened was I drove to Calabasas to to Brett's house, right, to meet him, and we hung out, and um, it was kind, it was it was cool because he's, he's a PA guy, and so like you know I that's felt right, very that's where they're from, right? Yeah, like it was just really instantly like comfortable, but then it was kind of awkward because at one moment in the conversation he goes. Well, are you a fan of the band? I mean, do you like what we do? And of course, I said, oh, yeah, definitely. You know, and, and there were, honestly, there yeah. were songs that I liked, like Nothing But A Good Time. I really liked that It's song. just a fun rock band. It's not yeah. anything you're going to go, but, you know, like, look what the cat dragged in. They're but just fucking 80s, you the know? The fact of the matter is, is that a few years earlier, I was in a cover band when I was 15, 16, 17, and I remember I, I didn't want to play Poison songs. Yeah. Because I wanted to play more complex music, and so here I am now in the future in this in front of him, <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, yeah. I mean, I don't want to play your songs, but I'm a video. yeah, yeah. So it was yeah. kind of but comical. But there's a check. There's a check involved, <laughs> right. right? So it was kind of a little little comical there. But anyway, we did hit it off. And did they so, try any other guys out? Did he? They tell tried him? one other guy, uh, Blue Saracino. Oh yeah, I remember him. Yeah, and um, what happened was. I went to their rehearsal place, and I was the the idea was to play their songs to see how I sounded. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, which is interesting because you're a technical you and, and Blue Sarancino also are miles from CC. Different so, kind of. So player, immediately yeah. it's going to be totally different. Right. It's going to be hard to underplay. Right. No, because I'm really lazy. I mean, yeah. all that all that fast shit takes a lot of work for right, me. Like, I'd right. rather just. So it was actually kind of welcoming, you know. <laughs> so I was like, "All right, cool. I get to relax." So I was playing. I never. The point was that I never really learned the songs the right way. I listened to them. I remember listening to them and not even picking up the guitar, just like hearing the chord progression yeah. and saying, oh, "I know. Okay, that's G. That's D. That's A." And then it goes to this thing in E. That riff. Okay, I know what that and is. The chorus. And I'm like, you know, making you know coffee in the morning, listening. <laughs> You're not stuff. even trying it on the guitar. I, I don't think I ever actually picked up the guitar and played it when I learned it, but I knew what it was. So I knew that I knew what was going to happen once I picked up the instrument. So yeah. I get there. 
The first thing that happens, I had like an old Marshall, like 70s, kick-ass 50-watt head. Something goes wrong and smoke starts coming out. Oh, of it. yeah. So now fuck. I'm like, oh, fuck, I can't get my sound. Oh, no. So then they pull out some other kind of ridiculous like crate head or something. Yeah. So now I've got CC's this amps. Screwed <laughs> he up left him fun. there. I don't know whose it was. It was like some random thing. And now I've got this fuzzy, creepy sound. And then I go to play, and it's cool for a while, and then suddenly like a bridge appears. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't remember this part of being in the song. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I fuck up the song. We have yeah. to stop, and then I read, show that, what's that riff? You know, all that bullshit. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, man, I started thinking I really blew this. So then they said, well, do you have any songs that you wrote? And at the time, I had this song called Stand. Yep, which, I, the, which became their single. Right. And so I played like a verse and a chorus of that. And they liked it. And then, I, and then I said, I have this other thing that I'm working on, which was called Fire and Ice, which is like a bluesy kind of thing, which eventually became a single for the record. Right. It was like the second single, right? Yeah. And you just basically wrote their songs for them. I wrote about seven of the songs in the record, and then we co-wrote the rest. But what, what happened in that band, the minute a song went on a Poison record, it became a Poison song. So oh, everybody really? split it four ways. Oh, wow. Which is interesting. Pretty cool for them to think, you know, because they came out think as a so. team, and they kept it together. I mean, you, that if you're moving across... That's what's cool. See, yeah. that's what I like to be. you're moving it. together exactly. across country and yeah. you've got a dream and you're living in a studio apartment together and you get that deal and you fucking make it, that's great. Yeah, that is great. Man, I love that. But yeah. if you got... If you moved out here and then found dudes and you got a guy that's always playing video games and smoking weed and he right. wants cut in, eat a dick. Right, right. But it takes, <laughs> it takes a lot to leave... Pennsylvania in a fucking van or whatever yeah. come out here to Hollywood in the 80s where it's so fucking evil that's what they did too yeah and, and that's and what they did and it worked right. so, so the yeah formulas... that's badass that they did that and it was actually nice that they did it with me too because here I'm some 21 year old kid that kind of comes out of nowhere and, right you know so everything it was it was cool that way what about the touring it was that split four ways and all everything no no, 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 it wasn't, and I and I understood why it wasn't. Right, it yeah, you're just a hired guy then, except for the no, songwriting? it was a percentage deal. The gotcha. songwriting was everything on the songwriting was four way split, right? And then there was a percentage deal after the the tour, and then CC was also being being paid too, even oh. though he wasn't there because what? Because he was a part of the oh, band, like, like a corporation. You know, like you said, you know, I mean, he helped make the band, so yeah. they're not going to just fire the guy. So they had to work a deal with him. So there was a lot of paper back then you know to, yeah. to have everything have it all work but as it related to to the creativity and the songwriting that was that was equal now what year was this uh i joined the band in 1991 so to be fair they're already on the way down because here comes fucking Soundgarden and alice and yeah, but nobody let me say this because yep. there's a there's a lot of misconceptions about what was happening then Nobody really knew what was going on yet. Right, yet. In other words, when th at the moment I joined Poison, they were just in People Magazine having the biggest grossing rock tour that, that year. Wow. It was in the top 10 grossing rock tours. I remember reading it. The band was still a huge band. And from the, po the point where I joined the band to our record being done was from 91 until 93. And everything changed. Yeah. And, 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 and a, lot, a lot of those bands, they just went away. When our record came out, Stan was, was, went to number four. Yeah. I and, remember. And it was the a video heavy rotation in MTV. And everyone was saying Poison is the one band that was going to break through. And, and at that point, we were. Our, our, our record shipped gold. And, and things were happening. And we were doing well, considering that nobody else was. And something very weird and unfortunate for us happened the the distance between when stand was on heavy rotation right and i remember rem was on, was out and they were yeah. doing great what's that that's me bands. in the corner that exactly one, right yeah and so everything was awesome for some reason capital waited way too long to release a second single and when they did they decided to release like a a, a blues ballad oh yeah and by that point and the video we made, unfortunately, was the wrong video to make. Yep. 
Stan was cool. The, I think the yeah, guy had the Sam kids. Sam Bear did Stan. Stan uh, Who did it? The guy oh, that's Sam in Nirvana. Bear. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I love him. He's yeah. I, I've met him a few times. Lives in, in Malibu. Great dude. Yeah, so, he, so the video had this whole... Everything was working. And then time went by. We waited too long. We put out the wrong song, made the wrong video, and then bang like that, the album, the campaign was over. And we were already on the road, and we did really, really great business in the south but then in the major markets it was clearly not yeah. what it, we weren't going to be changing people, of the guard going to be in people magazine this time you know <laughs> yeah, I mean? yeah yeah and so exactly it was a changing and so are people looking ended. at it because of you are you feeling that heat when you're on the road like where's cc are you getting any of that no 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 i i i, I didn't get any of that actually i i got the impression that the impression that I got was that Poison made the right move in the right uh, direction. Musically. Yeah, they had to grow. And that's the only reason why the stand even worked is because of, of what we did. Right. You know, and, and, and just the direction that it went in. But then what I'm saying is months later when the tour started and when the, that next single went... It, everything it was just a, a different a different climate right and right it was, right it didn't matter who, who was who on were you on the road with who was oh uh, we i think at one point it was damn yankees oh yeah those i remember guys. lita ford i think was on a couple of the shows yeah and um i might be forgetting something it was a three-month tour right and then you come home and it's over right yeah you, you start dating the drummer's uh chick i did that yeah. pretty much uh, ended my my time in that band do you regret that at all? No, no, hell no, no, not at all. Because yeah. I, I knew exactly what I was doing um, at the time. I, I, we were very much in love. We got married. I have a beautiful daughter. How did that fire up? You're out on tour. Is she out on tour, and you're seeing her around all the no, time. No, it fired up. It's God. It's so long ago. But what happened was, Ricky and her split up. Right. And there was. Um, a, there was a lot of time that went by, but we always had this weird kind of energy from the beginning. Right. At first, like, I couldn't stand her. I thought, like, she was, like, a real bitch. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly it, it started to change. It got kind of weird. Like, it's kind of weird. Yeah, like, when you're on tour? No, I wasn't on tour. Oh, you had you met her, like, at the beginning when you're making the, the record. At the beginning, I joined the band. I gotcha. And so um, I remember we... We're writing together because she had a record deal and she was still with Ricky, but they were having problems and we hadn't done anything yet. And she's like, you know, I'm really in love with you and this and that. And we haven't even done anything. I said, that's really, you know, crazy. I mean, there's definitely feelings there, but I said, How, prove it. Yeah. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, who move out of his house if you're so serious about, you know, how you feel. Right. And at the time, I'm living in a tiny little you know, 400 square foot uh, studio. Guest, studio, guest house. Now you gotta and, know, you gotta know this is gonna fucking rumble the, <laughs> rumble the band, I just right? figure I'm calling her bluff and I'm like, yeah, I mean, if this chick was single, I'd, yeah, it'd be a no brainer, but like totally. I'm in the band and suddenly now we're supposed to be writing and there's this weird energy and now there's this kind of crazy talk. So I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll move. I mean, th there were five, you know, Top line cars parked in the driveway. You know, the, it's a two million dollar house. Yeah, and now that house is probably worth you know six million dollars. So yep. it's, it's like it's a, uh, it's a certain lifestyle. Yeah, leave the lifestyle. Yeah, that's and, what I and chicks uh, after a while they'll be like, ah, maybe not. So, which is right. So and this is actually like the true, true, true story. Like yeah. I mean, I've tell version of the story, but this is like the literal true story. Oh, we're getting the dope. This on is like to be told. You're on your radio show. You're getting <laughs> yeah, like yeah. the full on. You that, caught me at the right time. I didn't sleep last night, so that's probably oh why good. I'm a little whacked out in the head. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I tell her that, and she. Um, uh says okay no problem so whatever she goes away and a couple days go by and i go over to ricky's studio and he comes in and he said i can't believe what's going on i'm like what because diana just moved out of my house she took a suitcase she took all her shit and she left and i'm like what do you mean she, goes, she just said it's over She's done, and she left. I said, well, where'd she go? She moved in with her friend. I'm like, really? <laughs> in your mind, you're going, oh, fuck. I said, like, now, absolutely. I'm like, oh, fuck, because we're supposed to leave to go on a tour. Right. So we uh, 
she ends up I don't know I see her or something but I still never like go the full yeah what, right all the you're way. like oh this is like, fucking crazy right this is weird so then the, plus you're I, making some good money in poison right I was making money, yes, yeah. I was spending all my money on clothes, actually. Yeah, yeah. I remember I used to go to... That was the... You know what? That was the most screwed up thing about that situation in the band because I didn't know what to do <clears throat> when I when you make money. Yeah. And I was around guys that were all multimillionaires. And, and yeah. what used to happen was I started living like them, but I didn't have... I had a nice car, but I didn't have like the You house. didn't have the back millions. Right, right exactly. From the first three so records. I would go shopping and yeah. like they would buy clothes at Maxfield. Yeah. So I would go into Maxfield and I remember like spending twenty eight hundred dollars on a pair of red chrome hearts pants. Yeah. I remember being in Milan at the Versace outlet, buying this ridiculous blue thing that was like four thousand dollar suede thing. Yeah. I remember wearing it once and, and then like but it's like but not really having enough money to not being smart enough to buy a house. <laughs> it was just really, re and then the, and then I leave Poison and literally I didn't have any any money. We just got outfits. I had a lot of ridiculous clothes that I that I couldn't wear because they were just ridiculous. Yeah. And then what what reset me was uh, I got a, a deal with Geffen and it was a really good deal. Yeah. And I got signed to Warner Brothers as a, a publishing and suddenly I was like. Right, I reset myself, and I started my. I really started my career at that point, but it was weird, man. Being around, being a kid, which I was, yep, around guys ten years older that had been at that level for a long time, yeah, and suddenly like, all right, we're going to dinner. All right, well, we're going to this rest, and the bills like whatever it is. All right, that's cool. I guess it's normal to. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like like a twelve hundred dollars steak yeah, dinner, yeah, and you're throwing down three, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I understand. You know like, what I'm saying? I, I I know because what happens is also you want to fit in. You don't want to be like, well, I can't really afford that. That's kind of weird. You know what I mean? They're yeah. like, so you just blaze into Max Fields and you drop five grand and then you're going, fuck, you got enough in outfits for a down payment on a home at and the time. And don't realize it though. Yeah, and don't realize it. Yeah. You know? It's true. I remember specifically seeing you and the drummer's uh, lady. You came to Steve Fontano's wedding. And well, we were probably already married. By yeah, then. you were married. Yeah. yeah, but what I'm saying is, you came in, you were wearing like crushed velvet bell bottoms and a blazer. Uh, I'm sure and, I was. And you, and you looked like you were in like the faces in 1972. Yeah, that was my thing. Yeah, yeah right. I, lo I love that era of rock. Ascot on and shit. Right, right, you came right. in, you played with like the band, Did and I then play? you just left. And oh, we were like, what the fuck was that guy doing, yeah. man? It was uh, a Saturday, right. and you were like- <laughs> Probably hot faces. outside, right? Yeah, like, well, it was hot as fuck. It was in Marin, and you were just like velveted up. And, oh, my and Lord. It. And everybody had known, like, he stole the drummer's lady. Now, look yeah. at, you know, it's right. so weird. I was weird. The, the evil guy. Yes, yeah. So you, uh, I was you the start devil. seeing her. I started seeing her. And do you I, tell Ricky? I told Ricky, here's what happened. I, I was on tour. And one time I flew to Philadelphia and she met me there. Yeah. Another time um, I, I came home. Right. And then... It got to the point where, like, all right, I can't really do this because I'm on tour, and I have my own. Bobby and I had our own bus, yeah. And I'm not like, I wasn't messing around with any of the women because I was like totally in love with the. <laughs> yeah, they're like, hey, and, dude, like, look they, at all these they, chicks. They really, I mean, it was getting weird. Like, they're not that this is bad, but they're no, like, are you gay? Yeah, right. They're like, and I, and I like, you know, I'm like, no, I'm I'm not. Honestly, I'm not. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's women, and then I had to tell this story because earlier. A year earlier, we, Brett and I were in Europe, and I met some chick that was like this, this French model, and so I made up this story about that this you're chick. in love with her. That, yeah, that oh she's in she's in Canada and you know in Toronto, and she blah blah blah. So we'll bring her out on the road. So then, oh this no, how, how fuck up this was, and and I'm like thinking on my feet. I'm like, yeah, but she she won't. Why won't she come up to her? I said, don't take this the wrong way when you meet, but she hey, she hates the band. Oh. You're just going, you're just I, making... I like, you're kidding me. Well, you know, as long as you're happy, you seem happy. So one night, I'm at a truck stop, and I'm talking to Deanna, and Bobby comes out of nowhere. Uh-huh. And so he and I were together all the time, because yeah. we were living together on the bus, basically, for right. three months. And he grabs the phone out of my hand, and, and I, I have the second to say, Bobby's going to take the phone from me and talk to you. Think quick. He takes the phone, 
and he starts um, talking to her, talking to her, and it's Diana. Yeah, and, and he, he knows, knows. For four years. He knows he's known her, and he's like, "All right, well, you know, Richie must be really into you because he's not messing around out here and this and that." And he hands the phone back and walks away. And she, he says, "Oh, she sounds like a really nice girl." Wow. Mind you, doesn't put together the fact that I a, a week earlier earlier said, "Oh, she's a French model." Right. It's no French accent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she must not have been talking much. So anyway, in the end, um, we did the Jay Leno show, and we were in L.A. And I was like, I I can't do this charade anymore. Yeah. I got to tell Ricky what's going on. Wow. And. F- and there were more shows booked. We right. were finishing in San Francisco, but we were in Sacramento. And um, we were scheduled to have two weeks off and go to South America. And like I'm thinking, there's no fucking way that I'm going to South America and keeping this good. Like, f- I'm done. Wow. And like, so like I, and I got to make a decision. I definitely am more into my relationship with her than I am with the band. And being in the band. Yeah. And so fuck it. I got to tell him what the fuck I did. So how do you do it? So I'm in a room uh, before the show in Sacramento. We had San Francisco was the next night. And that was the end of the U.S. thing. And uh, I'm sitting on a sofa much like this one. Yeah. And there's a sofa like that. And I tell the guy to go get Ricky. I got to talk to him. Yeah. And so he comes in, and mind you, like so much, like three months have gone by. From the outside, it appears as though he's moved on, but you know, I'm yeah. still a 21 year old kid, and, and he's a 32 year old man. It's, there's a difference. Yeah, you don't I, know. You gotta, I don't really I, get he's it. Done with her. I mean, you just told a story about me walking into Fontano's wedding dressed yeah. like it was 1971, yeah. and, and suddenly making an appearance. Like I really didn't get it on, yeah. on any level, other than like. Yeah, well, you're I 21. My, yeah, and I'm Fucking 21, and, and I'm roll. in a in a huge rock band. Suddenly, <laughs> yeah, and, and you're from, from Pennsylvania. Well, yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? It's just rock and roll. You're like, I'm living the dream. <laughs> from the woods, yeah. the backwoods. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm sitting there, and um, he comes in, and I said, uh, I got a issue. I got to address with you. It's probably going to be a huge problem, but. <laughs> I want to tell you because I don't want someone else to tell you. Yeah. And so what is it? And I said, well, I've been, Dion and I have been seeing each other. I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, we've been seeing each other. He said, well, I mean, I know you guys have been writing together for her record, but like, what do you mean? And I said, like, together, like the way yeah. that you wouldn't want to know we were together, like seeing each other. Yeah. And like he literally, and I'm like this now, and I'm in a position where I'm expecting him to dive on me. Right. So I'm thinking like, all right, Get what's, ready. My, what's yeah. my Aikido, you know, Steven Seagal move going to be? Is yeah. he going to go through the window or is he going to go over my shoulder? Yeah. So I'm like waiting for him to jump on me. And he just kind of puts his head down like this. And he stands up and says, I, I can't be in the room. He said, I got to leave. So he leaves. So I immediately panic, and I go on the bus. I wake up, Bobby, and I'm like, dude, this is going to be a huge fucking problem. Yeah. He's like, what do you mean? I said, I just told this. I told him what I told him. He's like, you're full of shit. I don't believe you. I said, go on their bus. I said, hell is going to break loose. I'm telling you. So he goes on the bus. Yeah. And then suddenly <coughs> Brett appears on my bus. <laughs> he goes, you're out. <laughs> and he goes, listen. He goes, I don't know what to tell you. He said, I don't... I, part of me thinks you're lying. Yeah. Because part of me thinks that you want to be fired from the band because there was something in my deal that like... Oh, if I you quit, couldn't quit? I forfeited something. Oh, yeah, right, or if right, I, if right. they fired me, then they owed me something. There was something like weird language in the, in the yeah. deal. And so he says, I don't even know if you did this. He said, I know you're not happy in the band because by then I really wasn't. Right, it started to go down. Started, the, and then, we're, then they didn't want to play the new songs and suddenly I'm playing... Hold on, I got to piss. It's on. Okay, so then he comes on and says you want to. He thinks you want to get fired. Okay, yeah. He says he thinks I want to get fired from the band. So then I convince him that that I'm telling the truth. Right. And he goes, well, he goes, I um. What did he say? Um, he goes, well, he said, there's no way we can continue with you in the band. Yeah. He said, you know, the first t- thing I told you when you joined the band is that we don't fuck each other's women. Right. And although the interesting thing is, I always suspected that he fucked my girlfriend. 
Isn't Re- that interesting? Really? And I think he probably did. Wait, which girlfriend? Prior to, to a, a girl that I was dating. Oh, you had a when chick I, like when you first, when joined, I first joined the band. Yeah, yeah, I always thought that. And that's why uh, at, at a certain point, I always knew I was going to dump this broad. Yeah. But I always suspected that. So there's a... there's a, there's. You like ever a, ask her later? No, I, yeah. I could give a shit. Right. Didn't care. It's just, but it, the point was that like, okay, so you... It's a double. It's a double It's a standard. bullshit. It's a whole, the whole thing is bullshit. Yeah, yeah. And the fact is, is like, I'm coming clean with this and I have, you know, I'm... You know, I'm, I'm, we're getting. I'm going to marry the girl. You know, yeah. and I did. She was. It wasn't. I had to marry her. Yeah. You know, we didn't have. She didn't get pregnant until halfway through our, our marriage. So it wasn't like some kind of. Oh shit! I, I fucked up, dude. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was yeah. like totally like you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and they were done. So anyway, uh, they said, "All right, well, th- that's it. You know, so we're going to play the show tonight." And then I don't know what we're going to do. So we play wow. the show. Yeah. And no one will look at me on stage. I mean, every now and then, Bobby and I make eye contact. And he kind of like shakes his head like he can't, still doesn't believe what I'm telling him. Dude, where are you at? In Sacramento? Yeah. That's hilarious that the crowd doesn't even know. Nobody knows time. what went on. Well, you, you guys are up there and it's like, talk dirty to me. <laughs> then, you, know, you know, you're playing songs like, look what the cat dragged in. <laughs> you know, every rose has a thorn. Everything's oh, yeah. up back there. He's oh, just like, yeah. motherfucker. No, Oh, shit, it does, right? Yeah. That's fucking funny. <laughs> well, and so, yeah, so then uh, I played the gig. Um, so the tour manager says, all right, well, basically, you just got to get your stuff. And um, they booked you a flight back to L.A. Get your stuff, your amps and shit? Not my amps. Right, no, right. All that went to, right, back right. to Rocket Cargo. They canceled San Fran the next day. They canceled night? San Francisco. Unbelievable. And they got they got um, blues Seriously, to no. do the rest of the tour. Right. Um, Deanna and I, I didn't have a house at the time, so I, went, I moved into her place. Yeah. So then we went, from there we went to Philadelphia, and I, I had a bunch of song ideas, and I finished writing them. And then from Philly, went back to San Francisco and went to Coast. Remember that studio? Oh, yeah, it was great. That's and I, re- I did a record. I recorded in my demo, like seven, eight songs, and she sang on a bunch of shit with me. And then literally... A week and a half later, I was signed to Geffen. Wow. It was all like boom, 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 boom. And, and now I the, word, the word was out that you uh, and her were get together, right? Uh, Nobody knew shit until I, until I got fired from the band. Right. Until I told them what was going on. Right. And then, then there was something on MTV that was like, in rock news, blah, 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 yeah. boys and guitarists. Yeah. But it was spun as if like, like suddenly like, he walked into a room and there it was. Like, yeah. That, like, yeah. Yeah, it never yeah. went down that way. Right, right. But of they, course, they, that's they how they want it. They made it so dramatic. Imagine now at TMZ. They would have been all oh, over yeah. you everywhere you went. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it would have been worse. So you signed the you signed a deal with Geffen and you put a record out with Geffen? Oh, that was another tragedy <laughs> because, you know, I, I put my heart and soul into a record and right as the record's coming out, it's like, well... Uh, the A&R guy that signed you is leaving. He, he's going to Sony. So you're out. So like, what, what, uh, okay. So they just, they put out 15,000 copies of the record here and stuck them in the stores and, and whatever happened, happened. Yep. But in Japan, uh, it was MCA and they actually promoted it like it was a real record. Yeah. So suddenly it opened up a good four or five years for me in a territory where I could actually make money because at that point you couldn't do anything without a record deal. Right. So once I lost my Geffen deal, I was I got I was I had this horrible stigma of 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 oh the guy from Poison, the guy from Poison, Poison, Poison. Yeah. Like, of course, if you listen to my records, I don't sound like that. Right. Um, but man, you got you got labeled as one of the uh like, you know, Glam guys, yeah. Because now grunge is in full effect, full, full, full effect. Yeah. So you're like, you, you know, Gavin can't put like the guy from Poison on you the know, cover. There's so many things that people don't realize that happened to me. There was a point where I was gonna. This is how weird, like behind the scenes stuff is. Like, I had a deal lined up with RCA yeah. where they were gonna take take me. Yeah. And after the Geffen. Yeah. Right. It was like, which is following year. people don't understand. I've had a few uh, guys on. We talk about you get dropped. You're done. Right. Cause well, you owe lab- lab- labels money and it's a, somebody else's vision and they feel like, yeah, this guy was ready to sign me. And I was at this point now it was a couple years later. And my manager says, whatever you do, or, cause I, my manager's house, he said, whatever you do, don't play him your new demos. I'm like, what do you mean? 
because because you see he's you're going to confuse him because the point of the matter was is that he wanted to sign me based on that record i did for geffen he loved that record right and he wanted a record like that but now two years have passed and suddenly i'm back in this blue-eyed soul thing right and everything i'm writing sounds what, like r&b what was the geffen record sound like, like a rock it, the geffen record was the record that interscope like wanted. a john mayer or something no no oh, it was a rock record it was, it was a, a rock hard record. rock like gotcha. power trio like what was that one called ball, uh, Motherhead's family reunion. Oh, I remember that. I remember. Yeah, yeah. it was a really kick-ass rock record. Yeah, and it was the record that like Interscope actually wanted. Tom out of Wally's me. over there going, "What a cocksucker!" Totally. <laughs> he said that to me. He said, "Not cocksucker," but he said, "That's the record I wanted." He said, "But you, you made that when you were 24. You couldn't make that when you were 20." Right. And now right. here I am, 26, and the RCA thing's happening, and my manager's like, "Don't play him any demos because they're all like straight R and B demos." Yeah. You know, like really R and B. Yeah. And you mentioned John Mayer, not too far off of what John Mayer's doing now. Right. And so, um, of course, I'm so excited about my songs. And, and like, we have a deal. We yeah. have a budget. We have everything. We're going to just sign it. And so I'm like, well, let me just play you this new song. Oh. I have a song called Rust that uh, now, when I play that song, I, like, my fan base loves the song. Yeah. It goes over great. But back then, you know, it's all this corporate bullshit. Yeah, yeah. You, you're you're a long haired guy. You I mean, it's play. grunge is in full effect, right, right. and you're coming out with R and B like, but, "Ooh, baby." But the whole point is, man. Th then suddenly, Jamiroquai appears. Yeah. Like, okay. Well, here's a white dude doing exactly what the fuck I was Perfect doing example. four years ago, and it's fucking huge. But you guys want to pigeonhole me for some twisted reason. You gotta have vision, man. It's perfect example. Yeah, yeah. Like I did a movie called The Long Shot. It's a football movie, and they're like, "Yeah, nobody wants to see a." drama football movie put in some shucking and jiving jokes and bullshit and it comes out at the same time as blindside and uh, ours eats a dick because it's this shape you know hoopty comedy that was supposed to be like rudy and then blindside comes out who they have a vision and it fucking wins graham uh, academy awards and and does millions you know what i mean so totally. it's vision from a guy there well, it is, white soul Jamaica. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and and that happened multiple times where suddenly it's like you can't do this because, and then boom, you turn around, someone else does, and it's the exact math equation. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so you guys are all fucking clowns. So anyway, the point is, is that he, uh, I can't resist. I play the song, I blow the record deal, <laughs> and so like you know, it's like being that crazy artist where you you know you're so excited about what you're doing, yeah, but. People are in business, and they're looking at you like you were in Poison. You were a shredder guy. Yep. You made this rock record in Geff. We want you to do this, because that's what we know we can sell, because that's what we see when we look at you. Right. Uh, another interesting thing that was happening at the time that nobody knows about um, was I had my manager had gotten the call that Ozzy was interested in me being his guitar player. Wow. Uh, and Zach, who's this after Zach? Zach had left. They had done some stuff. With one guy, Holmes. I'll tell you the exact the timeline was Zach left. Steve Vai was doing some stuff there with him. And it, for whatever reasons, it didn't come together. So my manager plugged me in. And they flew me to New York a couple times and really liked me. We worked out a deal. I sat down in the lobby at the hotel with Sharon face to face the night before i watched dumb and dumber with with ozzy in his yeah. room we were hanging out wow that's so she, she sat there and said they told me what they were going to pay me that i could sell my own t-shirts at the gig and it was this great love fest i was sending riffs that they were he was going to write to and all this stuff and suddenly i told the wrong people what was going on and back then there was aol chat rooms yeah and people were all in these chat rooms and somebody went in that's close to me and announced that I was going to be Ozzy's guitar player, oh. Poison Richie Kotzen, and they yep. said it that way, and it turned into chaos from the fans. Poison's guitar player is playing with Ozzy. Fuck no that. fucking way. Fuck that. Fuck that. And I swear to God, the minute those posts went up, yeah, my manager never heard from Sharon again. Yeah. And so it's a, it's just an interesting thing how the Poison thing has been a great opportunity for me, but also it stopped me from doing stuff. But then at the same time. When my manager told me about the Ozzy thing, my first reaction on the phone was violent. I remember I was at my parents' house in Philly, and I said, are you out of your fucking mind? Yeah. I just told you I don't want to play metal, and now you're telling me to, to go play with fucking Ozzy? Yeah. That's exactly what I said yeah. at the time, because I still, as an artistic 
basically had a vision for myself yeah. and knew what it was that I wanted to do. And none of it equated to the opportunities, even though they were good opportunities. I didn't, and in the end, it didn't work out anyway. Yeah, so but whatever. still, yeah, But the thing that I have to say, it wasn't until the internet changed to the point where I could actually make whatever fucking record I want to make, put it out, and suddenly now... I do better now than I could ever imagine. I'm totally happy with the right. way it is. Yeah, I, mean, I can do you... what I want. <clears throat> and I got people that know me, that know my music, that yeah. like what I do, that'll come to my shows, right. and, and I can survive. And, and they so don't really they... know the... Uh, a lot of people don't maybe even know, don't even know you're in Poison. It's been so long now. You know yeah, I guess. I mean, you know, yeah. Yeah, now yeah. with the winery dogs, you know, a lot, uh, the thing I hear is people, oh, man, Richie Conson, like some people... That's all they think of when they hear my name, and they say, "Oh, I never knew you even sang." Yeah. So you know, right? Yeah. I don't. I never think about what people think. It's like I. Yeah. That's why I lost. That's why I lost so many record deals. Because yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm like, I want to do what I want to do. If I'm going to do music, I'm going to do music that I want to do. If I'm going to make money, then I, I would have went. If I wanted to make money, I would have went to school and studied law. Yeah. I would have, you know, I become a real estate developer. I, I do something that makes money. Yeah, like, real it's money. It's just a fucking lucky coincidence that I can make money from music. But that is not why I learned to play music. It was not to make money. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, fuck money if people get into something for money i just can't stand them right away Unless like if i see for money right right ways. right no i'm talking about art yes like you get i made a comedian and then they're starting out and they go hey how much money you make you know you make some money now i go no i don't make any money i don't have any money right now and that's not why i'm doing it exactly you know, i never played music for 25 years to for money right you know what i mean right. that was not even uh, you never get together with guys who go man we're gonna write this song and make some money that's the furthest it was more of like fuck we're playing rock yes you know what i mean totally influenced it's by like a lifestyle it's just what you and then it becomes like what you do it's like well if i if i didn't i mean if i didn't write it i learned it's a creative process that i love it's like for me it's a release like i've done stuff that wasn't music but that was creative and I felt the same reward as when I wrote a song. Yeah. So it's really the, I'm not a guy that needs to get out and do gigs. It's like, I like the creative process of it. It's like me with comedy. Yeah. Like I, it's a, it's a different creative uh, thing, you know, or making films or anything, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, a little side note, which is funny. I, uh, I didn't see you for a long time. And then I started hanging out at Jay Davis's show at the yeah. Laugh Factory Life of the Party. And a lot of people know that um, that Michael Richards had the meltdown on that famous night. But I was there the night he blew up on you. Yes. Which is an incredible story. Would you like me to tell that story? Yeah, because I don't think From a lot of people know. <clears throat> so well, I remember I'm at the factory watching yes. comics, and he comes on and tell me what happened. Well, I remember I had a very, very bad day, first of all. Yeah. And uh, I'm friends with Jay as well. And he invited me and my girlfriend at the time and my friend and his girlfriend to come out to the comedy show and so he gave us like the best seats up Upstairs. in the balcony yep no right one up in the middle, private in the balcony. center and so the show started and people got up and there was a lot of funny people and i was having a good time and then suddenly he says we have a very special treat that michael richards is going to get on the stage and um so he came out and i was very excited yeah we all were because he had, wasn't doing stand up. All no. of a sudden, he's starting to do it. So people are like, oh, whoa, Kramer. Yes. And so he comes out, and immediately it went dark, but not dark in a way of dark comedy. Like, dark in a way like, like we were just a bunch of meaningless morons that didn't know anything about anything. And suddenly he had all the answers. And, and it's kind of like, you know, you have to realize. If it wasn't, so if it's not for the public, you 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 don't have the opportunity to get up and do what you're doing right now. Yeah. So it's kind of yeah, it's yeah. kind of the opposite. Without and the it, audience, what we you're do nowhere. is what what makes you because your commentary on us and our activities. Yeah. Without us, there's no there is no what you're doing right now. Exactly. And so he started taking it like really dark, and so he started. He said something about the military that was really 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 horrible. And it, it hit a chord with one of us that lost someone. And so I just got up and went to the bathroom. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to leave for a minute. Maybe by the time I get back, he'll be doing comedy. And it won't be this whatever he's doing. So I sit down. And suddenly he goes on this thing about Jesus. 
and he ties it into to what he was saying earlier, and then there's some other vulgarity, and then he he ends his sentence with "Where is God anyway?" And I simply I don't know what it was a surreal moment, but the place was dead quiet. No yeah. one was clapping, laughing, or anything. Huh. And I leaned forward. And I went, and I, and a part of the thing that's funny, I have to tell you what I was wearing because I had this big black cowboy hat and big black beard, yeah, long, long hair, and I looked right out of the south like Leonard Skinner, and I leaned forward and I just said, "Wrap it up." <laughs> and when I said that, I heard my voice like, "Wrap it up, wrap it up," and I'm like thinking, "Was that was that me? <laughs> did, did I just do that?" And he it looks like around. like Tourette's, right? Yeah, and he looks around and he goes like this. He's not looking up there because it's dark up there. And he yeah. goes, who said that? Who said that? Who said that? And he's pointing. And I continue, and I said, God said that, and he's up here. <laughs> and, and he looks up and he goes, oh, he says, you think you're God? I said, no. I said, no, that's not the point. I, the reason I said the God thing, because he said, where is God anyway? Yeah, right. So I said, God said that, and he's up here, asshole. And he looks up. He said, oh, you think you're God? I said, no. I said, I don't think that. I said, but I think I came to the laugh factory because I wanted to laugh, and you're not funny. Why don't you get off the stage and let someone get on the stage that's funny, someone that can make us laugh, because that's yeah. what we're here for. Yeah. And so he didn't know what to do. So he says, oh, oh, okay, okay. If that's what you want, all right, I'll leave then. I'll leave, I'll leave. And people are like, one person clapped. Maybe it was you. Yeah. And, and, and then everyone else is like, oh, what? What's going on? So... In this one little moment, uh, someone comes over to me and says, Sir, if you're going to do that and you're going to heckle the comedians, you're going to have to leave. Yeah. I said, I I'm really sorry. I don't know why I did that. That's not my character. I won't do anything like that again. I I'm sorry. So in the moment that that person left, Richards came back on the stage like a lunatic yeah. and screaming, Fuck you, fuck you. And then he went on kind of a racist tangent because he called me a, a redneck yeah he said you redneck motherfucker it's because of people like you that the world is this world is that yeah now, all i said was that you're not good at what you do it's not because of people like me that the world's fucked up yeah so he goes on this crazy tangent calling me names and then i think he said something like you old washed up 80s rocker he said so something something so, so then so my he says what are you trying to do impress your girlfriend so now she flips out and she jumps up and starts screaming at him. And I heard what she said. Yeah. And she said, you may have been funny when Seinfeld was writing your shit, but you're a fucking has-been. Fuck you. Ugh. So then he starts screaming at her. And I swear to this day, I heard him call her a spick whore. Wow. And so they're going back and forth. And she's screaming literally over the railing. Yeah. The place is erupting in chaos. Absolutely. And suddenly this huge dude comes over and is lifting me out of my chair. Yeah pulling me out of the place and so she's doesn't realize that i'm being thrown out so i grab her and say hey i said they're throwing us out yeah so she calms down then we get to the bottom of the stairs yeah. and he runs off the stage the bouncer gets between and he says something to the effect of i hope i made your night or something like that i said no i said you didn't make anything i said but you should be thanking me because i made your fucking set until i opened my mouth this place was fucking dead i made your night <laughs> I remember he goes, he was like, come on. He wanted to fight and almost. I, and we all, please, yeah. he would yeah. be dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. yeah. So we go outside and Jay comes out. Yeah. And he, he starts saying, um, he starts saying, uh, I'm so sorry. You know, I, this, I said, why are you sorry? Yeah. I'm the asshole that opened my mouth. I shouldn't have done that. But I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. So here's the thing that nobody knows. Yeah. A week later, well, everybody knows this, that yeah. he went nuts on, on those black folks that were in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, when that happened, there was talk, because they caught it on film, there was this talk about he should pay 100 grand for every time someone says the N-word. Right. And I just thought that that was, I thought what he said was horrible. Yeah. I thought what he said was wrong. I also thought that he shouldn't have called me a redneck. I know that's nearly as bad. I also thought that he shouldn't have called my girlfriend a spick whore. Right. So I think all of it's wrong. But I, I don't, someone was saying he should pay 100 grand for every time he said something racist. And I thought, that's really weird. So I wrote a letter to Larry Elder. Uh -huh. I don't know if you know who Larry Elder nope. is. But Google him. You'll okay. know who he is. He has a talk show. All right. And I wrote this letter just talking about Michael Richards and about the double standard in society when it comes to, to race and what's acceptable, what isn't, and, and how people think. 
And I, I must have wrote this letter really well because I'm listening to this show yeah. in my kitchen and I was actually soldering. I was working on some electronic gear and I, I always would listen to him and he started talking about Michael Richards and he read my letter on the air. Wow. And then I tried to call in, but I, I couldn't get through. But um, he l read my letter and it was just an interest. I, don't, I have it in my computer somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show it to you Yep. next time I see you. Um, but it was just interesting, like the whole, yeah. the whole turn of events and, and, and how it's it went really down. It's really a weird shitstorm of two weeks for him. For him, know? yeah. Because uh, I don't believe he's a racist at all, actually. To be honest with you, I just think that he, doesn't, he has a, an issue controlling his temper and, and he doesn't know his skill set. Right, of, of stand-up comedy. That's what I'm trying... It's like yeah. me suddenly trying to go out and play flamenco. Right. It would be a disaster. Yeah. And then getting mad because people say, hey, you don't know how to play flamenco. It really kind of uh, labeled him forever. But See, now he has a TV show now, doesn't he? Yeah, but I don't think it did any good. Right? Okay. Uh, it was the one with, uh, what's her name from Cheers? Yes. Christy Alley. Christy Alley. Christy Alley, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Uh, oh, it's an interesting uh, thing. And we were both there, and it was wild. Yeah. And, and wild I remember, A lot of people don't know that story, so it's yeah. good that you... I learned so much that night, because I hadn't started comedy yet. My, in my mind... Oh, really? Well, no, I've only been doing comedy uh, four years now. I'm on my fifth. But what, how, that, what, what was that? Like, I don't know, 06 or so. I don't know. I don't know when it was. Yeah, it was quite a few years ago. It was ago. a long time ago, but I remember in my mind, I was going every Tuesday, and I was like... Man, this new comedy was great. Like CK would be in there, and and uh, you know guys had never seen before. And yeah. Chappelle's show was he did he showed up there yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 all and Jay was having these guys um, that I was like well you know Daniel Tosh and and these guys Dan I was Cook like was always in yeah there. and I was like yeah. this is a new kind of comedy wow yeah. this is uh, you know and I, boy I got hooked you yeah. know and now look like, I'm doing it of course that's cool um, and and then I saw you at the show last week. Yeah, it was fun. how'd you like the show? It was fun. I was pretty hammered, so I don't remember much about it. Yeah, you still party like crazy, right? I like. I that. go through phases. I don't know. You know, I, I go through these phases where um, I, I just I, I I don't I don't, and then I then I do. Yeah, you know? I, I don't know why. Just the way it is, and then sometimes it's like you know, it's uh, it, I just it's who I am. Yeah, know, yeah, whatever. yeah. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I I've never been. I mean, I've definitely been in positions where I thought, man, I, actually, this might be the night that I just dropped dead. I yeah. think that might happen. What kind but, of stuff? You but I've never, I, I, I've always, I've always been able to recognize that, yeah. and then just say, okay, pump the brakes. Yeah, you know what I'm trying to say? Like yeah. I, I would, I would always be able to pump the brakes. I and, understand and, it. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. if I partied now, I could probably party uh in the right way mm -hmm. you know uh instead of seven day benders with blur of mm. just rolling around in an automobile and bowling and then fucking playing rock and then mushrooms and then booze and where are we we're at the russian river swimming <laughs> you know what i mean it's just right. like a, yeah, that's pretty over the top and yeah. that's kind of finding yourself at sure. a young age yeah. you know yeah, what I mean? absolutely but um i get so high from comedy that it, I don't think it would ever be able to match the uh, booze or drugs will match that. As cheesy as that sounds, boy, man, when I'm up there and it's going good, like Saturday I just did the store and it was going incredible, it's another world. You know, it's like, of course. Whoa, it's man. like, yeah, it's like you write, if you write a song, suddenly it's like it's a yeah. high or you, know, yeah. you have a great gig or totally. You know um, what I remembered mm. was I recorded in your studio about five years ago. It was like the last thing I ever did. You the one in North Hollywood. Yeah, it, I don't I, have that anymore. I, I sold that. You sold to it to the guy Blink Travis. 182, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh. I recorded while you had it there. Oh, really? Yeah, I remember you. I hit you up and I went in there and recorded for like a weekend. Brian Tishy played drums. Oh wow! Uh, and uh, I don't know. It was the last thing I did ever. Uh, I did four song demo. I loved the studio. It was great. It just sat, it had a vibe. It was cool, man. I haven't been in the studio since they bought it, so I don't know what they changed or or, or anything. I was in it when you had it. No, I know. Yeah, I made yeah, it a right. studio. So, oh, it wasn't. A, yeah, yeah. It wasn't a studio when I bought the building. Right. It was a. It was a. The guy was an architect. Yeah. And that was his office, and. Um, I converted it into a studio. You did Gene Simmons. Uh, Gene he did Simmons his record, record there. What yeah. record? I think it was called Asshole. Asshole. Yeah. 
Oh my yeah. god! And and what was it like working with Gene? I see his son all the time. Nick comes to yeah. the comedy store three times a week. Oh really? I think he might be able. It, Maybe I think, he'll start doing stand up. I think he's. I think he's, he's probably toying with it. Yeah, because the way he's there a lot. He's, got that he's look not in his there eye. a little bit. He's, he's great. Yeah, he said he'd do the podcast. I we love played his together sister. on New Year's. If you, his dad and, and me and we all got up and at the Sayers Club and played on New Year's a, a few years ago. Now, what was Gene like? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just really want I mean, the coolest you're, people. You start and listening let's to forget, Kiss. Let's not forget that this is someone that, you know, I used to dress up yeah. as when I was a little kid in the woods in Pennsylvania. That's and, what I'm saying. And suddenly, like, he's in my studio, like, you know, hanging out, talking about whatever. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's pretty cool, you know. And the funny thing, when I first met him, the first time I ever met him, the first thing he ever said to me, um, we had the same manager at the time, and it was after Poison. It was when I was signed to Geffen, and I walked back into this room where everybody was. It was some concrete foundations forum thing that yeah, they yeah. had, and he yells across the room, yells my name, says, don't think you're going to fuck any of our women. Oh, really? That's the first thing he ever said to me. Wow. And it was just obviously hysterical, and everyone yeah. was laughing. Yeah, and then yeah. uh, years later, someone... Uh, recommended he come to my studio and I was really nervous because I didn't know what to expect and I heard he's a very serious guy. Yeah, yeah. And so um, he comes in with a little cassette tape and, I, and he's like... Micro cassette? These are my ideas. I want to listen to them and decide where we're going to start from. And it's a, it's like a DA-88. Like, like people, oh, like that's Not a DAT, a DA-88. It's like an eight-track digital eight track format that i don't know who uses it anymore <laughs> yeah. and i'm i'm like oh my god and i looked at alex my engineer and alex speaks broken english oh alex was great that's yeah. what i had he was like from another country bulgaria an yeah. amazing uh yeah, he's great. engineer he's great yeah. the guy was over the top good i can tell you how i met him too okay. but um i'm looking at alex like what the fuck are we gonna do with this and so luckily i had a number of a guy that rents stuff and yeah. i said well you, we don't have this machine because this is an outdated media form yeah but uh if you want to go get lunch or whatever in an hour we will have it here and you can listen to whatever you want to listen to so we moved quickly and and, and then you know he he liked the studio yeah it, was, it he had kept me he kept it me going there for a while because you know i didn't know what i was in for it, it really turned out to be more of a, of a real estate thing than a than a studio thing yeah it was an opportunity you know, I, I held the building for about three or four years. Yeah, you make some money. And, and then it. got out at the right time. And you, you don't make money in, in the studio business. Not recording business. No, no. Not, re not recording studios with bands. It's anymore. property. Yeah. And so that's what it was. And, and I, it was a great place. I got a lot of great memories from it. And a lot of cool people came through there. Yeah. But um, in, in, in the end, I realized real quick that, you know, there's not selling studio time isn't really like you know, yeah you're gone most yeah, people don't need it terrible yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah especially yeah. at that era too yeah, yeah. But now it's just straight pro tools mm -hmm. so you got winery dogs now i do and how's that going the winery uh, Eddie dogs. trunk loves it <laughs> he does boy that guy goes crazy over it every second right thank god for eddie i know that's a good i'd and, probably be homeless by now it's like me like i love rival sons so anytime i can shout them out I, it's a great yes. rock band. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I promote them nonstop because if you believe in a band, uh, I think it's back to the old days of word of mouth. And I think uh, that's great in a lot of ways because when you discover a band where a guy goes, hey, man, check out Winery Dogs. Yeah. And you and you hear it. It reminds me of the seventh grade at the locker. And the guy goes, man, you heard Scorpions? Right. And you go, Scorpions? No, they're from Germany. You got to check it out. And you and you hear like, you know, that, you know, that make it real or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just going like, fuck, Scorpions. So I, I enjoy finding bands that way now, you know. And it's cool that uh, Eddie Trunk shouts it out hard, you know. I appreciate Eddie. Yeah, he was the actual... Um reason why it came together out of the blue it's a real weird thing that happened too because i literally a month before i was talking to one of my friends like man 
I haven't been in a band in 10 years. Right. And I, I love my, my solo career and it's my passion and it, you know, it's a release for me and I do whatever I want and it's fun and everything. But I said, man, it's almost like I, I want, like I need a break from myself. Yeah, you know what I, I mean? understand that. And so out of nowhere, Eddie's like, hey man, you got a minute to talk? And text message and I said, yeah, call me. And she calls me. She said, I was talking to Mike Portnoy the other day. And him and Billy had been doing different things together. And they were trying to do a band, like a power trio with John Sykes. Right. And it just fell apart. But oh, they, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And so they still want to do something, but they don't know who to work with. And I suggested maybe that you want to work with them. And that's how it started. They came to my house. Right. And uh, we jammed, and, and we ended up making a record. And, I mean, I was shocked the thing came out, and it... It charted at 27 and out of 200 on Billboard. That's and fucking crazy. We're doing this, this thing era. like homespun style, you know, and yeah. uh, and we were number two behind the Stones on iTunes and the rock downloads. And uh, I didn't, you know, I got to mention that because like for someone like me, like I, I never get on a chart of any kind. <laughs> yeah, country. right. And, and especially <laughs> at an this asshole end chart. of your career. Like, yeah. and most people, they're just like, you know, like you know, a guitar teacher now. Yeah. And, you no, know, no shit. and you're over yeah. in Japan or wherever playing fucking three piece with a record on the charts. What was here? The record chart. Here, yeah. But and I'm saying uh, you, you could play like all over sure, the yeah. country. Yeah. So yeah, we went around and, and, and we, did, we did go to Japan actually. That was our first gig and the second gig we ever played we filmed and made a dvd that's awesome which is insane like what lunatic like no that's great show. too though because you get that early early like fire and chemistry before you can overthink it like ah, i would have done that different yeah but that's why this is great Zeppelin, yeah. and you know they never sounded like 69 again yeah you know yeah. what i mean they come on they're like acid rock and you're like what the fuck you know so like, that yeah it, it, it's interesting man and i guess you know yeah, it's a journey. It's like it's like a little roller coaster, you know. Yeah. It's like up and down. Yep. You still living in that same house over there in Studio City? I live in uh it's kind of Studio City. Like I'm I'm in the same zip code as you, but I'm like right at the cusp where Studio City meets uh I went to a house you had the pool in the back and had the fence around it cuz you had your uh kid. Well, and that went a, how long ago? I don't know, years ago. It had a studio in there and stuff. Okay, then that's that's the same house, but it's radically different now. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the fence is gone. And you can the look down onto different. the one-on-one. Yeah, it's yeah, the same house. I know it, yeah. And, um, but it's it's way different now. You got to come over. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the night... Yeah, the, yeah. The yeah, night of the comedy... She was hitting me. He was listening to your new stuff. We were over there, and somehow me and my girlfriend and... And my buddy, we we stayed up until like six thirty, seven in the morning, yeah. bullshitting, talking, and it was fun. <laughs> Jay, Jay wanted me <laughs> Somehow. to go. Jay wanted me to go uh, yesterday. Yeah, and I I, was, I, I can't do that because I have a gig to, uh, tonight. Well, actually, this is gonna this is off time. Yeah, 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 off time. But let's talk about that before we go. Uh, I gotta say, some of the you play at the uh, hot potato. What's it called? I'm playing at the baked potato. Baked I potato. do a little residency there because it's close to my house. Right. And it's, it's simple. But, man, you can see some of the stuff on YouTube. You do Sarah Smiles, Watchtower. A couple of covers, yeah. fucking incredible versions, Thanks. man. Thanks. I mean, who are those guys in that band? Oh, I love those guys. The, they've played together since they were young. And it's uh, Mike Bennett is the drummer. Yep. And if you ever go to Sayers Club in Hollywood, he's the house guy there. Right. Uh, so he plays with a lot of people. And then the, the bass player, Dylan Wilson, is just amazing and not only just plays great l rock lines but he's got like a funk groove and yeah he, he plays upright like a monster yeah i'm doing this um uh, releasing a record in a couple of months it's called the essential richie Constant. it's 32 songs oh that's great there's two brand new ones that no one's heard i got a video that we made for one of them that's crazy i'm playing a theremin yeah in the, in the thing yeah that's the zeppelin thing if people don't know like exactly wow, wow. or beach boys that's yep. for the beach boys also uh somebody else used one but oh, um a radiohead yeah Radiohead. yep uh so anyway uh i did a couple of re-records and i had dylan and mike come in and play uh percussion and upright bass yeah so it's it's cool working with guys that can add a different flavor you know, this comes out on monday are you going to be doing a residency this month the or? the next gig uh from this interview will be i believe 
March if March fourth is a Tuesday, then yep. that's the gig. Oh, I'm gonna come down and see it. Yeah. And I'm playing. Obviously, this will be off time, but I'm playing tonight. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. playing. Yeah, yeah. That's I'm gonna come down March fourth. Yeah, you should definitely. come Yeah, down. I want to come down. But you watch the stuff on YouTube. It's fucking great. And Thanks. then I'll get up there and sing with Richie. That'd be great. We'll and do we'll something. do Sarah Smiles or Rich fun. Girl. You're a rich girl. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I love that you one. That. And you've gone too far. <laughs> awesome. That shit's great, right? All right, man. Thanks for coming by. Thank I you, love dude. you, dude. Happy yeah, birthday, man. We're awesome. still alive, right? Yeah, we're doing it. There he is, Richie Cotson. Oh, wait, you got a website or a Twitter or anything? I have all that stuff, uh, richiecotson.com, and then on there is the links to the, okay, the cool. right Twitter and the right Facebook and all that. Thank you so much for coming by, dude. Cool. Great, Thanks, man. man. A long time no see. Right. Or, I mean, no, I mean, I see you, but, you know, a long time we've known long each time other. Long time no talk. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. There he is, Richie Cotson. See ya.